Hello and most welcome to H1989 of the H series. It's a brand new article for us. An article by Michael Starks. Remarks on Wittgenstein, Gill, Chatting, Incompleteness, Impossibility and the Psychological Basis of Science and Mathematics. Mathematics. <laughs> mathematics. It's quite a handful of a title, I'd say. It is maybe best to start with the abstract. Let me just tell me something out of the box. Mathematics has been a big part of the series before. We have discussed constructive mathematics by Brouwer or intuitive mathematics. And uh, We've been pondering the options of uh, Platonic mathematical realism and the constructive idea of Brouwer. Wittgenstein is quite interesting in this particular for this particular reason. He was acquainted both with Gödel. And he also read some of Brouwer, actually. So he was in both camps. And I think you'll find that Wittgenstein's position is somewhere in between or nowhere there nor here. And that it's neither something transcendental, nor is it solely of human doing. It is rather a combination of criterion and action that decides mathematics. Mathematics! <laughs> it's a language game, actually. So it's something that we play as well. And the different varieties, varieties of mathematics are not identical or exactly belonging to the same category. They are rather uh, belonging to the same family. We just had Christmas here. It's the 27th of December. It's a family celebration. and. You can, see, you can see mathematics as an extended family with uncles, cousins, and uh, sister-in-laws and such, people who married in. We even have, have an expression in Sweden, plus children. Those are the children of your new spouse. So you get them for free. So they all belong to the same family, covered by the same love. <laughs> and uh, all encompassed, although they are different, they're not stemming from one as Richard Dawkins would have it, one original DNA origin. So actually, it's not very far from what we discussed uh, earlier when it comes to origin in Bible texts, for instance. This obsessive looking for the first course of some sort. Here, the recommendations seem to be go with the flow. Use it, don't overuse it.
it is what it is and it has evolved by humans for humans that doesn't make it extra human so it's undefinable as such it's something we do Let me read you something. What do you say? Should we start with the abstract, maybe? <clears throat> Let's see. Let's begin with the abstract. It's commonly thought that such topics as impossibility, incompletement, incompleteness, power of consistency, coming from Graham Priest, and decidability, randomness, computability, paradox, paradox, uh, uncertainty and the limits of reason are disparate, disparate, scientific, physical or mathematical issues having little or nothing in common. Oh, in common. <laughs> I suggest that they are largely standard philosophical problems. That is language games, mm -hmm. which were resolved by Wittgenstein over 80 years ago. Wittgenstein also demonstrated the fatal error in regarding mathematics or language or our behavior in general as a unitary, coherent, logical system. Here you have it. Logical system as in as in, as we usually think of mathematics, like uh, one thing, the Gödelian idea that it has coherency and correspondency, rather we are here seeing it as a family of concepts. A motley, motley of pieces assembled by the random processes of natural selection. A family, so to speak. Gödel shows us an unclarity in the concept of mathematics or language or our behavior in general as a unitary, coherent, logical system rather than a motley of pieces assembled by random processes of natural selection. I repeated it for good sake. <laughs> Gödel shows us an unclarity 
in the concept of mathematics, which is indicated by the fact that mathematics is taken as a system. And we can say, contra nearly everyone, that is all that girdle and chaitin shows, show. Wittgenstein commented many times that truth in math means axioms or the theorems derived from axioms. Axioms! axioms. <laughs> <laughs> False means that one that one made a mistake in using the definitions, and this is utterly different from empirical matters where one applies a test. A test. A, a test. A test. Wittgenstein often noted that to be acceptable as mathematics in the usual sense it must be usable in other proofs and it must have a real world applications Real world applications. Real world applications. But neither is the case with Gödel's incompleteness, since it cannot be proved in a consistent system. It cannot be used in proofs, and unlike all the rest of piano arithmetic it cannot be used in the real world either either <laughs> as Rodich notes Wittgenstein holds that a formal calculus is only a mathematical calculus that is a mathematical language game if it has an extra systemic application in a system of contingent propositions. Contingent propositions. propositions. <laughs> <laughs> For instance, in ordinary counting and measuring, or in physics. physics. Another way to say this is that one needs a warrant to apply our normal use of words like proof, proposition, truth, incomplete, 
number and mathematics to a result in the tang of the tangle of games created with numbers and plus oh. and minus minus, minus signs etc and with minus <laughs> <laughs> and with incompleteness this warrant is lacking Rodic sums it up admirably on Wittgenstein's account there is no such thing as an incomplete mathematical calculus because in mathematics, everything is algorithm and syntax, and nothing is meaning yeah. semantics. I make some brief remarks which note the similarities of these mathematical issues to economics, physics, game theory, and decision theory. Decision, decision theory. <laughs> <laughs> It is commonly thought that such topics as impossibility, paraconsistency, I will not reread that. Philosophers constantly see the method of science before their eyes and are irresistibly tempted to ask and answer, answer questions in the way science does. This tendency is the real source of mathematics. That <laughs> <laughs> leads to leads the philosopher into complete darkness. Darkness almost. What we are tempted to say in such a case is of course not philosophy, but it is raw material. Oh. <laughs> Thus, for example, what the mathematician is inclined to say about the objectivity and reality of math mathematical facts is not a philosophy of math mathematics but something for philosophical treatment <laughs> <Good. laughs> one might regard all these issues in many contexts as scientism that is as matters for scientific investigation where the facts will provide answers whereas they can be shown to be philosophical matters of how the language is to be used used
Thus, we may say of some philosophizing mathematicians that they are obviously not aware of the many different usages for the word proof. <laughs> and that they are not clear about the differences between the uses of the word kind, 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 when the talk of kinds of numbers, kinds of proof, kinds of, I don't know, as though the word kind here meant the same thing as in the context kinds of apples. Uh, apples. Apples and pears. Or we may say that they are not aware of the different meanings of the word discovery when in one case, we talk of the discovery of the construction of the Pentagon. The Pentagon! And in the other case, of the discovery of the South Pole. Ought the word infin infinite to be avoided in mathematics? Yes, where it appears to confer a meaning upon the calculus instead of getting one from it. One from it. From it. From it. Porridge has nicely summed up the Wittgensteinian view of scientism in these contexts. There must be no attempt to explain our linguistic conceptual activity as in previous reduction of arithmetic to logic. No attempt to give it epistemological foundations. Oh, foundation. <laughs> as in meaning-based accounts of a priori knowledge, no attempt to characterize idealist, idealized forms of it, as in sense logics, no attempt to reform it, as in Mackey's error theory of Dummett's intuitionism. Dummett's Intuitionism. 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 No attempt to streamline it, as in Quine's account of existence. As in Quine's account of existence. 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 No attempt to make it more consistent, as in Tarski's response to the 
Liar paradoxus. Liar. Liar paradoxus. A man from Crete is a liar. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. No attempt to make it more, to make it more complete, as in the settling of the questions of personal identity for bizarre, hypothetical teleportation scenarios. Well, hello, Tegmark. <laughs> Telemark. <laughs> Telemark. <laughs> The more narrowly we examine actual language, the sharper becomes the conflict between, between it and our requirement. Well said. For the crystalline purity of logic was, of course, not a result of investigation. It was a requirement. Requirement? No. <laughs> Wittgenstein's remarks on Gödel's famous incompleteness theorems are especially notable as they have until recently oh. been almost universally misunderstood. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Poor Wittgenstein. <laughs> it might justly be asked what importance Gödel's proof has for our work. For a piece of mathematics cannot solve problems of the sort that troubles us. The answer is that the situation in which such a proof brings us <coughs> is of interest to us. What are we to say now? That is our theme. However queer it sounds, my task as far as concerns Gödel's proof seems merely to consist in making clear that, clear what such a proposition as Suppose this could be proved means in mathematics. In mathematics. Suppose this could be proved. Means in mathematics. Here is one of Gödel's own characterizations of his work. Oh. 
my theorems only show that the mechanization of mathematics, that this, the elimination of the mind, mind. and of abstract entities is impossible, is impossible. If one wants to have a satisfactory foundation and a system of mathematics, I have not proved that there are mathematical questions that are undecidable <laughs> for the human mind. <laughs> but only that there is no machine or blind formalism that can decide all number theoretic questions, even of a very special kind. Yummy, yummy. <laughs> you get that from. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> It is not the structure itself of the deductive system, systems, which is being threatened with a breakdown, but only a certain interpretation of it, namely its interpretation as applying formalism. Blind, blind, blind. Blind formalism could also be called chat GTB. Blind formalism. Formalism. Blind formalism. <laughs> In my view, it was shown quite convincingly by Wittgenstein in the 1930s. That is shortly after Gödel's proof. That the best way to look at this situation is, a, is as a typical language game. <clears throat> Though a new one for math at the time, at the time. That is true, but unprovable. Theorems are true in a different sense. Different sense. Very important. Different sense since they require new axioms to prove them. They belong to a different system, or as we ought now to say, to a different intentional context. Go, 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 go. Next. Context. Different context all together they belong to a different context all together No incompleteness, no loops, no self-reference, no tautologicals, and definitely not strange Wittgenstein. Gödel's proposition. Sorry. 
which asserts something about itself, does not mention itself. And could it be said, Gödel says that one must also be able to trust and mathematical proof when one wants to conceive it practically. As the proof that the propositional pattern can be constructed according to the rules of proof. Proof. Oh. Or a mathematical proposition must be capable of being conceived as a proposition of geometry, which is actually applicable to itself to itself. And if one does this, it comes out that in certain cases, cases, it is not possible to rely on a proof it is not possible to rule on a proof. No. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. no. Oh no. What can we do? These remarks barely give a hint at the depth of Wittgenstein's insights into mathematical intentionality which began with his first writings in 1912 but was most evident in his writings in the 30s and 40s his 30s and 40s. His 30s and 40s. <laughs> His 30s and 40s. What do you say? I wouldn't believe if I didn't saw it. Wittgenstein is regarded as a difficult and opaque writer due to his, we know that, aphoristic telegraphic style and constant jumping about with seldom any notice that he has changed topics nor indeed <laughs> what the topic is. But if one starts with his only textbook style work, the blue and the brown books, and understands that he is explaining how our evolved higher order thought works, it will all become clear to the persistent. Persistent. To the persistent. Sisu, sisu. Sisu, sisu. Wittgenstein lectured on these issues in the 1930s. Yes. 
And this has been documented in several of his books. Oh. There are further comments in German in his Nachlass. Nachlass. Some of it formerly available only as on a a thousand dollar CD-ROM. Wow, that was pricey. But now, like nearly all his works on P2P torrents, Libyan, and so forth. Canadian philosopher Victor Riddich. Victor Riddich. Victor Riddich has recently written two articles on Wittgenstein and Guru in the journal Erkenntnis and four others on Wittgenstein and Math. Math! <laughs> Math! <laughs> no wonder He lays to rest the previously popular notion that Wittgenstein did not understand incompleteness. Mm. Oh. Oh. Victor Rodich, Victor, Victor, Victor. In fact, so far as I can see, Wittgenstein is one of the very few to his day who does and not including Hegel, <laughs> though see his penetrating comment above. Related forms of paradox which exercise Hofstadter and countless, countless others, so much was extensively discussed by Wittgenstein with examples in math and language, language. <laughs> and seems to me a natural consequence of the piecemeal evolution of our symbolic abilities that also extends that extends also to music art games etc a natural consequence of the piecemeal yummy yummy Yummy, yummy. <laughs> Those who wish contrary views will find them everywhere. 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 <laughs> and regarding Wittgenstein and math, they may consult them, the consult Chihara in Philosophical Review. Chihara, 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 Chihara. Chihara. I have much respect for Chihara, Chihara. but he fails on many basic issues such as Wittgenstein's explanations of paradoxes as unavoidable and almost always harmless facets of our EP. EP. <laughs> Regarding Gödel, an 
and incompleteness. Since our psychology as expressed in symbolic systems, such as math and language, is random. Oh, well. Random. <laughs> uh, or incomplete and full of tasks or situations that have been proven impossible. Impossible. That is, they have no solution, see below, or whose nature is unclear. It seems unavoidable that everything derived from it, for instance, physics and math, will be incomplete also. I believe the first of these in what is now called social choice theory or decision theory, which are continuous with the study of logic and reasoning and philosophy. Mm. <laughs> 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 was the famous theorem of Kenneth Arrow over 60 years ago and there have been many since Arrow <laughs> <laughs> Janowski notes a re recent impossibility or incompleteness proof in two-person game theory. <laughs> <laughs> In these cases, a proof shows that what looks like a simple choice stated <coughs> In plain English, has no solution. In plain English. In plain English. <laughs> A mountain of literature exists on Gödel's two incompleteness theorems and Chaitin's more recent work. A mountain. A mountain. <laughs> a mountain. <laughs> Etna. Etna. <laughs> Himalaya. Himalayas. Mount Kilimanjaro. But I think that Wittgenstein's writings in the 30s and 40s are definitive. Cut in stone. Although Shankar, Mancuso, et al. have done insightful work, it is only recently that Wittgenstein's uniquely penetrating analysis of the language games being played in mathematics have been clarified by Floyd. 
طيب هلويا هلويا تعبتوا؟ Long still rings a bell and Wittgenstein on incompleteness makes paraconsistent sense. Getting more and more interesting. Perto, 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 perto. Umberto eco, perto, perto, perto. And the book, there is something about Gödel and Rodic. Miss, oh, what a title. Misunderstanding Gödel. New arguments about Wittgenstein. There we get some titles indeed. Berto is one of the best recent philosophers and those with time might wish to consult his many other articles and books including the volume he co-edited on para consistency hallelujah <laughs> a volume on para consistency <laughs> 2013 yes 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 wow yeah wow wow wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Rodic's work is, <laughs> is indispensable, but only two of a dozen or so papers are free online with the usual search, but of course it's all free online. Hallelujah, free, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, if one knows where to look. Oh no, oh, oh. And here we have even examples. Hmm, good tips here we got. Now we can find everything. Libgen Io and. Libgen Io. Io, Io. Libgen Io. I think I put a break there. <clears throat> Last would be when, when, as well. Torrents as well would be more unique, maybe if we can take it there. Torrents as well. So, so let me get a little first. How can you say easy way into this? This is maybe one of the most difficult things is mathematics and girl is not an easy thing. I can only mention that Douglas Hofstadter wrote a book uh, this thick came out in the late 80s early 90s somewhere there. Uh, Gödel Escherbach often uh, acronymed uh, JIP or GEB it's immensely difficult. So I will try to ease you into the thinking here so you get a little view of it. And Starks here mentioned Quine, very one of the biggest analytical philosophers, and his account of existence. I think it's extra helpful to bring that up because we've been speaking about existence before uh, when it comes to the discussion I mentioned like a, a hundred times Orge Bohr in the doctorate room in Copenhagen do not mention existence an atom does not exist now it can be a bit more precise here why wanted to have existence as one thing only something that you could put into the black box that it was one thing unitary and sharply defined against the outside so to speak but you can compare existence to kinds is it to say that 
This is the kind of apple. Is that the same thing as saying that is a kind of pear or that is a kind of banana? I would say when you first think of it, you would say yes. But here actually, and this is one particular thing from Wittgenstein, he says, no, we cannot be sure of that. Because apples and pears are different. That will also imply that kind is also different. So kind is not the same. We usually say apples and pears and bananas are different, but the word kind is always the same kind thing. We believe. We believe, yeah. And I think we have good reason to believe that. Absolutely good from, uh, from uh, language, but no, say this in time, look carefully. We cannot be sure. It is rather a family resemblance. Yes, they resemble each other like cousins and married in in-laws. So here is my point here. This I mean to the letter. It's not sharply defined. This is also a special thing. So we can use the Klein model and we can see that the external can actually enter from the outside. This is what we're looking for here. It's a global relation. So it's a widening rather than this narrowing that Klein is into. So it's not, you cannot sharply say quite is wrong, but it's a matter of expanding, expanding, seeing how it's actually used. And slowly you begin to understand, aha, kind, which is very close to existence, is used in similar way, very similar, but we don't know the differences. It's more of a family. Pause there if you want to hear. And now to some comments here. So I made a slight introduction, and the, the beginning of the text is stapling many things. So it's, of course, very dense. So uh, do not fuss or get frustrated or fret, maybe it's, it's, it's the best word here. In, in English. Everything comes in once, they will be expanded later in the text by Starks. But I still would take some, some small quotes here. The first page, second paragraph. Into the last time. Mm, yes, in the abstract, yes, actually, in, in the abstract, on the first page. Um, it's there. Ah, okay, okay, yes. So, Wittgenstein demonstrates the fatal error in regarding mathematics or language or our behavior in general as a unitary, coherent, logical system. <coughs> rather than as a motley of pieces assembled by random processes or natural selection. <coughs> this is similar to what I mentioned about Omen Quine here. It has some similarities. So it's about the level of strictness, the level of uh, how sharp <laughs> you want the borders to be. It's a bit like quantum mechanics. It doesn't say that there is an absolute difference between observer and observed. They come together, they are intermingled. So it's not that sharpness we look for here, but it's an expansion. And another helper here, I hope it helps, is that 
look at how we use mathematics in physics, then it comes <coughs> to use when it's not founded in a practice. You see how it sounds very Wittgensteinian? Then we don't know what sort of proof we have that become weak or weaker. This we can see repeated uh, a bit further down. There, yeah. Wittgenstein often noted that to be acceptable as mathematics in the usual sense, it must be usable in other proofs and it must have real world applications. But neither is the case with Gödel's incompleteness. So this is the specific Wittgenstein intake, and there's no wonder no one, no one has understood it, except for Starks here and some other fellows mentioned. Uh, it doesn't mean that the proof is false. It's just it becomes very weak, becomes incredibly weak. I like to compare it. One idea I got when I read the text yesterday was it's a bit like I am pointing in darkness. Nobody sees my hand. I can see it. But I'm still pointing. There's no doubt I'm pointing. And if somebody had an, uh, a darkness camera, they would see me pointing. So they could actually from a distance or via the camera say, Hans is pointing. But am I really pointing? No. I don't see anything. And neither do the other people in the room or in the darkness. This is a bit what happens when you lose the connection to, to something real. Pointing in the darkness. In a certain way, it's still pointing. But is it really pointing? Mm. No, I don't know. So, <laughs> if you go further down, another way, the last sentence here, another way to say this is that one needs a warrant to apply our normal use of words like proof, proposition, tree, incomplete, and so on. To result in the tangle on games created with numbers and plus and minus signs, etc. And with the next page, incompleteness, this warrant is lacking. And Rodich sums it up admirably on Wittgenstein's account. <laughs> there is no such thing as an incomplete mathematical calculus. Because in mathematics, everything is algorithm and syntax and nothing is meaning. Semantics, meaning can only come when we are involved in doing something. Physics or calculating what the groceries was, will cost and so on. On page three, uh, we have the kinds and uh, the Pentagon is mentioned. I'll just briefly pass through that. At the end of page three, and here is a very good pointer from Wittgenstein himself. The more narrowly, so think instead of using the kaleidoscope we mentioned before, you use the microscope. The more narrowly we examine, the more myopic actual language, the sharper becomes the conflict between it and our requirement. So the more we go into the details, 
the more we sharply define and try to find the reason and explain, the bigger is the conflict between it and our requirement, that we lack proof, it becomes less. Very close to, <laughs> it's almost jokingly close to existence, these people who try to find existence or origin. The more closely they look for origin, the more they lose the ability to say anything. It starts hanging in the air. On page four, I won't read the whole thing, but it shows that there is a very interesting connections to uh, chat GTP here. And this is from Gödel himself. And what he opposes is in this site is that mathematics is something of a blind formalism. It's the, that quote there. Yeah, you got there. Uh, blind formalism is machine-like. What we are doing today, we couldn't do it at the time of Gödel. But now we can do it. So there is no machine that can, <laughs> so to speak, decide mathematics. So that also was understood by Google, but it's not so much understood today because AI or the majority of the AI researchers wants to do it otherwise. And then we go to page six. I will narrow it down, becoming a bit long. It's still very hard to understand. I won't make it any harder. So we have a friend in Rodic as well. And there is a connection here to para consistency. We mentioned that before with Graham Priest. What does, uh, what is the intention of Graham Priest? Well, it's actually to bring it closer to real life. He wants to hinder explosion, which has devastating results on thinking. And also closer to math, uh, computer science, where proof is used differently in at least five different ways. And in mathematics, one thinks that there is only one singular proof. So that's the last hint we give here. Uh, Caleb, if you may, you're welcome to jump in. <laughs> jump in into the conversation. <laughs> so on page three, I read a paragraph of this one. All the word infinite could be our in mathematics. Yes, where it appears to confer a meaning upon the calculus, instead of getting one from it. So here, infinite would be like the word meaning, or rather semantics, that we had on page two. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me see. Yes, um, nothing is mean. So, so um, uh, Wittgenstein doesn't want, uh, Wittgenstein says that there is no meaning or semantics in mathematics. And therefore, yeah, yeah, exactly. Not until you put it into a practical. Therefore, it's dangerous to say that there are infinite numbers mm -hmm. because it gives a meaning to them that is a telemarkian meaning. Mm -hmm. For instance, that yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. A, Plato, a, a Platonic meaning that there is a, a world of ideas mm -hmm. somewhere there, um, that they are uh, some way real and that they per, per se continue randomly. Yeah, yeah. For instance, or by random, themselves somewhere. Yes, that they are doing their own work. <laughs> yeah. Um, instead, we know thanks to chaos theory, butterfly effect, for instance, that you have to do uh, 
have to actually do the change, mm -hmm. small change, and then you will have this infinite, uh, I mean, one way, but there is no inf infiniteness in that, it's that uh, the numbers are very, very, very long, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are indeed, yeah. But it's that you, the observer, who made that the change, mm -hmm. or the butterfly uh, caused it. Could well be the butterfly as well. Mm. <clears throat> So there's, there's nothing wrong with doing infinite, but it doesn't have any meaning. <laughs> so take Mark or uh, Hugh Everett, they are doing things, but it doesn't start to lack more and more meaning. In the end, it becomes empty, absolutely empty. And uh, the only thing you can do in the end is create laughter. <laughs> this is what it is about. And the same goes looking too much for original or existence. Mm. It doesn't amount to anything. Mm, absolutely. You mentioned this already, Gilder. Mm. But since this is so uh, important today, mm. we should really print this out in cold letters. Mm. And those who oh, yeah. show it to those who have great faith in uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah, instance, yeah. Uh, and the key sentence here is, I think, um, <clears throat> the elimination of the mind mm. is impossible. Mm. Yeah. The, for um, these five, six verbs, yeah. the elimination of the mind is impossible. Impossible. So uh, that, that's this, it's a very, let me just point. Sorry. Mm, was, mm. This is a very sharp contrast to what people think today, as, as you said. Mm, mm. Like, you do remember that 99% of people think that mind is useless, mm. that you can sort of go into it and you can discover what I think about a lecture or something that we mentioned a couple of times before. So I'm, I'm a sort of a calculable, calculable system. Uh, I am uh, a computer maybe a bit more advanced <laughs> and Wittgenstein says absolutely no long before there were any advanced computers <laughs> that can never happen mm. it doesn't matter how advanced the computer is and the other key phrase here in this good quotation is uh, is this people have great faith in mathematics mm. and they think that uh, uh, soon we will have a su uh, super powerful computer who yeah. all mathematics mm. Uh, but I already feel so that it's not possible. No. Uh, why is it not possible? Uh, you need enough observer, mm. and like the famous butterfly effect, uh, and uh, because the system of the computer itself, you cannot say that there is truth in itself, uh, and there is no, how to say, uh, the, uh, the computer cannot create its own truth. In no, itself. no, no, it doesn't have a body, it doesn't have a human mind. Um, uh, because it would be, hmm, uh, it, it would be only other variant uh, that this is a truth in itself, and that is not possible. Uh, Sean Wagner. Truth in itself, truism are pretty useless. <laughs> we know that. Yes, the mathematical calculation themselves doesn't have any purpose. No, no. And they will lack meaning. Mm. Semantics. Mm, 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 mm. Most definitely, very good, <laughs> very good indeed. Yeah. Um, and page four on this, uh, Wittgenstein said that um, it is not possible to rely on a proof. Uh, let me see. Um, Page, page. Um, um, what is it? What you would say? No, the, uh, so he says that uh, it's not possible to rely on a proof. Um, <clears throat> uh, so they belong to different systems. 
Um, yeah, all proofs are different. They are they're not one kind of proof, just like the existence of wine or uh, the idea that kinds of apples are the same thing as kind of pears or kind of bananas or why not kind of cats. Mm. So somehow, well, you get the advantage, you get different cats, you get different apples, and you get different pears, but kind for some reason is the same. Mm -hmm. So the idea is you can extract kind and say, that's a thing in itself. <laughs> yes, yes. And it's identical somehow. Yes. Um, I think that's it's quite pedagogical, that thing. Mm -hmm. really kind. Let me mention one last thing. This sentence, which is really in parentheses, mm -hmm. but I think it's important. Um, <clears throat> for the crucial maturity of logic was, of course, not a result of investigation, it was a requirement. Mm, yes. So when we want purity of logic mm. uh, or the purity of origin or whatever, mm. it is not something that we find out. It was something that we require. Yes. And in fact, investigation, we can take it as a policy investigation mm. that in policy investigation you have things are not pure, mm. then they can never be pure. Mm. Uh, but our life either, everything is, uh, there's always something that is solid. Intermingled, yeah, intermingled. And uh, as the mass you showed, even in chess plays, there's huge emotions. So they're very dependent on having a, a, an extended family and those things. Mm. So you wouldn't think that. You think they are machines? No, he says. Mm. They are, it's very emotional. It's mixed up everything. It's intertwined and it's not really different. But we make the mistake, we want to isolate, for instance, existence or kind or proof mm. or truth. Mm. We, we, we stop understanding truth or origin once we extract them too much. That's the problematic thing. Mm -hmm. They are not problematic in themselves. And I think that the reason that there is uh, we want to eliminate semantics from mathematics, that is mathematics, it's not semantics, is that there are two uh, different language schemes. And uh, what we can say for people uh, who don't have uh, artificial intelligence is that they cannot even know anything about semantics. No, no, no. Like no, the example, yeah, yeah. Can then use the example of kind. Yeah, yeah. Of but let's end there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Helen and Bill, for your excellent comments. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, zooming in or watching in or whatever you, what would you say? <laughs> uh, have a very nice day, morning, afternoon or day, wherever you are. Bye bye for now.